الحمد للہ رب العالمین و صلاۃ وسلام و سیدنا محمد و علیہ و صحب اجمعین و من طبع ہوم بحسن اللہ یوم الدین الحمد اللہ لدی حدان لہدا مکن لنہ تدی لولا ان حدان اللہ و ان الاصدق الحدیت کتاب اللہ تعالی و خیر الحج حج محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم و شر الامور محتتاتها و کل محتتت بدع و کل بیت بولالہ و کل دعات فی النار اللهم لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وفقا في الدين يا رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته on behalf of Islamic Learning Foundation and Institute of Ikna i would like to welcome you to this new course on the 40 hadith of al imam al nawawi rahimahullah This is the first of which I would hope to be many sessions on studying these extremely important and timeless gems from our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more than 1400 years ago. Since that time they were transmitted these gems of wisdom and guidance have not lost their luster, relevance or potency. For the lay persons like myself who are not scholars or well versed in the knowledge of the deen, this small collection of hadith are so important to study. This will insha'Allah pave a path for us to be better guided and better equipped so that we can protect ourselves and families in these trying times of tribulation, deviance, and also against the temptations and traps of the dunya. But myself, my name is Abu Khashia Masood Ahmad Ranginwala, not a scholar muhaddad, but trying to be a student of knowledge, have been, alhamdulillah, studying these hadith, these 40 hadith of Imam Nawi over the past few years, and actually have been inspired by the commentary of one scholar, Dr. Jamal Badi, out in Malaysia. He is actually a professor at IIUM, International Islamic University of Malaysia, and he has written an excellent commentary on these 40 hadith. I've had the opportunity and fuddle to be able to collaborate with him on editing his work and enhancing its worth, which is the basis of this course. I've also had the opportunity to earn ijazah from Muhammad, Sheikh Muhammad Daniel, a famous muhaddith from UK. So we're going to begin this ijazah course with the Musalsal Hadith of Rahmah as per the tradition of Hadith teachers who teach or narrate Hadith to new students. And this is similar to a couple of the teachers who've taught me Hadith as well. And it has become a tradition often among the Muhaddith who teach a Hadith and narrate to new students. So this is the Hadith of Rahmah. حدثنا عبد الرحمن بن بشر بن حكم قال حدثنا سفيان بن عيينة عن أمر بن دينار عن أبي قابوس مولى عبد الله بن عمر بن عاص عن عبد الله بن عمر بن عاص رضي عنهما أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الرحمون يرحمهم الرحمن ارحموا من في الأرض يرحمكم من في السماء and this is a beautiful nice small hadith on rahma where the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says the people who have mercy, the all-merciful. Ar-Rahman is merciful to them. So have mercy on those who are on the earth. The one who is in the heavens will have mercy on you. And this is from Tirmidhi. Narrated from the Sahabi Abdullah bin Amr bin Az. And let us now go to the first grand hadith, the collection of the 40 hadith of Imam Nawi with full isnad, the hadith on Niyah, niyat or intentions. And inshallah, this will be a nice introduction to this collection. This is also the first hadith that Imam Bukhari put in his great collection, Sahih al Bukhari. So let us start with this first hadith of the collection of the 40 hadith of Al Imam al Nawawi with full isnad going back all the way to the Prophet through a notable number of names, some of the best. Of this ummah, and this is the hadith on intentions. Hadatani Muhammad Abu Bakr that Daniel called Akbarana Sheikh Abdul Rahman bin Abdul Hay al Katani and Waladi Hil Musnad Muhammad bin Abdul Hay al Katani and Abdullah Sukari 
Anil Waji, Abdul Rahman Al Kazbari, and Mustafa Al Rahmati, Anil Ghani, and Nablusi, and Najm Al Ghazi, and Walidi Hil Badr Al Ghazi, and Sheikh Al Islam, Zakari Ansari, Anil Hafid bin Hajar As Kalani, and Najmiddin Muhammad bin Ali Al Balasi Al Misri, and Muallifiha. الإمام أبو زكريا يحيى بن شرف النووي عن شيكه يبي أمر محمد بن أحمد بن محمد قدامة والمقدس عن أبي عبد الله الحسين بن أبي بكر المبارك زبيدي عن أبي أبي الوقت عبد الأول بن عيسى بن شعيب بن إبراهيم السجزي عن أبي حسن عبد الرحمن بن محمد بن مصفر الداودي البشنجي عن أبي محمد عبد الله بن أحمد بن خمي السرخسي عن أبي عبد الله محمد بن يوسف بن مطر فربري عن إمام المحدثين أبي عبد الله محمد بن إسماعيل البخاري يقول حدثنا الخميدي عبد الله بن زبير قال حدثنا سفيان بن يينا قال حدثنا يحيى بن سعيد الأنصاري قال أخبرني محمد بن إبراهيم التيمي أنه سمع القمة بن وقاص الليتي يقول سمعت أبا حفص أمير المؤمنين أمر بن خطاب رضي عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إنما الأمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ ما نوى فمن كانت هجرته إلى الله ورسوله فهجرته إلى الله ورسوله ومن كانت هجرته لدنيا يصيبها أو امرأة ينكحها فهجرته إلى ما هاجر إليه رواه الإمام المحدثين أبو عبد الله محمد بن إسماعيل بن إبراهيم بن مغير بن بردزبا البخاري وأبو الحسين مسلم بن حجاج بن مسلم الكشيري نيسابوري في صحيحهما اللذين هما صح القطب المصنفة and it is most fitting to start the introduction of this course with this hadith and its full isnad and change for several reasons. This is the first and most important hadith of this collection and perhaps the most important hadith in Islam. And this is the first hadith that Imam Bukhari puts in his collection. The most decorated and most top and authentic collection of hadith in history. This hadith is inshallah why we are all here. And by virtue of studying this hadith, it connects us with the Messenger of Allah, Sayyid al Mursaleen, through a chain of people spanning hundreds of years across numerous generations who were immensely righteous and knowledgeable. They dedicate their lives to emulate and follow the Prophet to the utmost of their ability, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and spread his teachings. We will, inshallah, in this course, get some of their insights into these great ahadith of the last messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Indeed, these are timeless prophetic gems of guidance and wisdom. And from this hadith, we should be asking ourselves, what is our purpose here? Where is our hijrah? To what is our goal? Because at the time of the transmission of this hadith, there was a great hijrah, which the Muslims at that time were commanded to do. That was the hijrah. But all of us are in a hijra. All of us are in a state of transit. We are going to either one of two destinations. Which destination are we headed towards? Are we headed towards the destination above? Towards the promised paradise? Or are we going to be stuck to this dunya and drop in the pit which Allah has promised for those who disobey Him? So let us also contemplate this hadith. It is important to realize that the sunnah is a great part and essential aspect of this religion. Allah says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ قُلْ أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ So here Allah says, Say, if you love Allah, fattabiyuni. So here the Prophet was commanded that if you love Allah, then follow me. Yuhbibkum Allah. And what can be greater than earning the love of Allah Azza wa Jal? And Allah as a return also will forgive your sins. Wa lakum dunubakum. Wallahu ghafoor rahim. 
So this is great. This is Bashara for all the Muslims, for those who follow the Prophet wasallam. But then in the next ayah, it is a stern warning for those who turn away from the Sunnah. He says, Kul wa Rasul," And obey, say obey Allah and His Messenger. فَإِن تَوَلَّوْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ This ayah, it really scares me. Because Allah is addressing the Muslims. Yet, He says, And whoever turns away, then indeed Allah does not like the disbelievers. So turning away from the sunnah is becoming like a disbeliever in terms of because their attitude is the one which is away from the sunnah. So anyone who tries to ignore the sunnah or plead ignorance and not love the sunnah, he is going towards this path. So to turn away and plead ignorance of his teaching is similar to the dislike of Allah for the disbelievers. We live in a society which is far from the sunnah of the Prophet and his teachings. And this is the case even in our own communities, masajids and gatherings. We have a choice to follow the best example or perhaps Allah will replace us with those who are more worthy. Another point to note from the Sunnah of the Prophet is that it is a reflection of the Quran. The Quran is directly connected to the Sunnah. These hadith have a divine element in that the Messenger of Allah was guided by Allah the Almighty. Allah Azzawajal says, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Allah Azzawajal says, and He does not speak from His desires. Indeed, it is but a revelation revealed. It is but wahi revealed. So this is basically stating the fact that the hadith of the Prophet emanate from the guidance of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ was also gifted with many miracles. The greatest gift, of course, which is the Book of Allah. And another where he said, This is a hadith which is narrated in Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ says, I was sent with the comprehensive speech. And this is reflected in all of these hadith in this collection. The Prophet ﷺ really was gifted with great eloquence and putting a lot in a few words. And we'll see this time and time again when we study these beautiful hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The character of the Prophet ﷺ also is reflected from the Qur'an. One of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ asked Aisha anha, about the character of the Prophet ﷺ. She said, "Kana Quran." His character was the Qur'an. What can be a more succinct summary about the character of the Prophet than this statement of the person who the Prophet ﷺ had the most love for. This is his, his wife Aisha. Anha. So the Sunnah is really a tafsir of the Quran, exemplifying the Quran in human form. Okay. Let's go forward. And we should also, as we are delving into this course and the first session, we should also just realize that there is great bounty on the seeking of knowledge. We're here obviously to learn more about the hadith of the Prophet and to get nearer to him and inshallah to follow his example. And this is basically the path of seeking knowledge. Indeed, the seeking of knowledge has many benefits and blessings. As per hadith in the book of Tirmidhi, Jamia Tirmidhi, where the Prophet says, Man salaka tariqan yaltamisu fihi ilma. The Prophet says that the one who treads a path towards gaining knowledge, Allah will make easy the path to Jannah. And may Allah make us, inshallah, among those dwellers of the paradise. Ameen. As we are trying to seek the best of knowledge, the teachings of the Prophet, who is the exemplifier of what the Quran is. Another hadith which as narrated in Ibn Majah and his great as Sahih, where the Prophet says, Talabul ilmi faridatun ala kulli Muslim. Where the Prophet says, the seeking of knowledge is mandatory upon every Muslim. So knowledge is a source for us to increase our iman, strengthen our actions, purify our intentions, and guidance to keep us from error. This is a treasure 
really which we can transmit to others verbally by our manners and all, of course through our actions. And this is also a means of attaining sadaka jariya, which is a great bounty to those who have sincerity. These scholars like Imam Nawi, for example, Imam Bukhari, Imam Abu Hanifa, are still benefiting from the knowledge that they had and they transmit to their students and others. And this is really a blessing that Allah endows to those, particularly those who have sincerity. Imam Nawi, we see from his life, inshallah, we're going to see how sincere he was. And for that sincerity, he's still being rewarded despite the fact that he is in his grave, rahimullah. Let us just remind ourselves of the greatness of this Naj as we begin the first hadith here in this, from this collection. Let us not stop and let us not be dissuaded from the difficulties of our life as well. So there's so much bounty in knowledge. Reviewing, memorizing this Naj only lifts our status and ranks. If you act by your knowledge, you will increase in Iman, Taqwa and guidance. And keeping and retaining our knowledge is not easy. It's not something which we can just grasp right there and then. Thus, this course is not just meant as inspiration. We want you to trap this knowledge by your pens. You should be writing notes in your notebooks because no one has or very few people have photographic memory. People are deluded that they can memorize everything what they're aware of. This is basically temporary photographic memory. It does take effort. Imam Shihab al-Zuhri said, whoever grabs Naj in one go, the Naj will run away in one go. Naj is only sought by spending many days and nights. Well, this is a Shihab al-Zuhri. He's actually uh, the first person to collect hadith and connect it to the proper isnad collectively. A Shihab al-Zuhri, he was one of the special people who Omar Abdul Aziz commissioned to collect the hadith and to ascribe to it the proper sanad. So, a very famous scholar in our past. Okay. The meaning of the hadith are based on the course textbook by Dr. Jamal Badi, as he mentioned to earlier, and we will add other additional points as well, which are appropriate. This textbook provides a simple and practical commentary on these ahadith and discusses other contemporary issues and practical implications to current times. Explanations from classical scholars are also mentioned in this book. So it's very important that you get this book. If you want a copy, just email me and I'll give you a link to the book. And it's basically $10. This is much more cheaper than what's on Amazon. Amazon's greater than $20. And you also get, we'll give you a hardcover copy, which is a special edition. The copy which is sold on Amazon or other online bookstores is a soft cover. So you get the better version and much more cheaper. And again, this is a non-profit endeavor. So please email me and inshallah, I'll give you the link to the book if you are interested. Okay. Now, one thing to note also, as I alluded to earlier, is that this is an ijazah course. So it is important that you keep track of which hadith you heard during the initial recital. That is mandatory to obtaining ijazah. If you miss that for any reason, we can go over the missed hadith in an additional session. If you are listening or watching the recording, then you should know that ijazah can only be obtained live, being in the presence of the hadith narrator. So after taking the knowledge from these recordings, you can contact me by email to set up a session through Skype or Zoom, where we will go over all the hadith in class with other students, inshallah. So again, email me also, but this is for those who go all the way to the end. So you have to stick with this, inshallah. Being in a jazza course, it's highly, highly recommended, and some people, in fact, obligate this, that you should memorize the full hadith in Arabic with the narrator. However, if this is not possible, then, and you should try, even if you can't memorize every hadith, you should try to memorize what you can. There are many hadith in this collection which are small and just a, a sentence or two long. Like, for example, this hadith, this is a hadith you should have heard many times before. So this is a hadith, the إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَةِ That should be put to memory. But if you cannot memorize all the hadith, then there will be a quiz on each of the 40 hadith that you should take so that, inshallah, we can issue an ijaza at the end of this course. Again, remember, an ijaza is a trust that you can narrate and teach the hadith correctly to others with its general meaning and the standard back to the Prophet 
So other points to just review for this course is that it's very important that you go over the hadith that's done. Read the textbook as well for other additional pointers and to add to your knowledge. I have my email address if you need to contact me for uh, PowerPoint presentations or the quiz for each hadith as well. So now let's go to this course. Okay, the 40 hadith of Imam Nawi. This collection has been recognized, accepted, and appreciated by Muslim scholars for the last seven centuries. And it has the status of Kabul or acceptance. Okay. Imam al Nawawi greatly benefited the Ummah by extracting a few hadith out of several thousand. And these form the foundation of Islam, they're the pillars of Islam. These prophetic gems have become a source of guidance and wisdom to many generations of Muslims, including those laypersons with limited religious knowledge and depth. Various principles are contained with these hadith, such as belief, fiqh, akhlaq, ethics, suluk. From this, it is very important that these hadith be properly understood and, and also based on scholarly and proper interpretation. This Muslim ummah, could benefit and advance so much if they invest in these hadith, these few hadith treasures. Many of the Ummah are in dire need of the correct understanding of the religion and of prophetic guidance. Now let's transition to the life of Imam al nawawi Rahimullah. And his full name is Muhyiddin Abu Zakariya Yahya Sharaf. He was born in the month of Muharram, 631 after Hijri. This translates to the Christian era of 1233, which is known as A.D. or Anno Domini, and we'll go over the importance of the Hijri calendar when we look at the life of Omar bin Khattab in the next session. And uh, Imam al nawawi he was born near Damascus, the south of Damascus, in the village of Nawa. Okay. His father was known for his piety and honesty and also ascetism, and had a big impact on him as well. As a child, there were signs of his piety and uniqueness. Sheikh Yasin bin Yusuf Marakashi says, I saw Imam Nawawi at Nawa when he was a youth of 10 years. Other boys used to force him to play with them, but Imam Nawawi would avoid the play and remain busy with the recitation of the Holy Quran. When his friends tried to domineer him and tried to get him and force him to play their games, Imam Nawawi often cried. On observing his sagacity and his being so profound, a special love and affection developed in my heart for young Nawawi. And this scholar, Sheikh Yasin, he went to Imam Nawawi's Quran teacher or teacher at that time and told him to take care of Imam Nawawi because he saw in him something very special. And indeed, he was. Then later in his teens, his father took him to Damascus to study. And think of the great joy that Imam Nawawi had at that time to be able to go to Damascus and learn Ilm. He already as a boy stayed away from games and playing and preferred the recitation of the Quran. I mean, imagine who would do that? Who would have that love and hope for knowledge? But Imam Nawawi, uh, think of how happy he was to go to Damascus. And at that time, Damascus was the center of religious and academic knowledge to which students from all over the world will go. And here, Imam Nawawi settled in Rawahia. This was a school in Damascus. And Imam Nawawi said regarding his studies the first two years, I spent two years without stretching out to sleep even for a moment. So for two years, Imam was the Imam Nawawi was only seeking knowledge. That's all he was immersed in, from day and night. He did not even stretch and lay himself down for a proper sleep in the first two years. SubhanAllah. He was so dedicated in his studies that he used to attend an astonishing 12 classes a day. And this is basically like 12 hours of hardcore academics of the ilm for the deen, encompassing many different fields. This covered practically the full spectrum of subjects for a scholar or alim. Imam al nawawi said that I wrote everything relating to the subjects, clarification of the ambiguous points, elucidation of the text, vocalization of the words, and Allah blessed me with grace during my time and activities, 
and help me overcome these difficulties. During his stay in Damascus, Imam Nawi studied from more than 20 celebrated teachers. These were the masters and authorities of the sciences that they taught. Nawi studied hadith, fiqh, grammar, and etymology. This is basically the origin of words from these great scholars of that time. His greatest contribution, however, was in the field of hadith. Imam an nawawi like other renowned Muslim scholars, had a wide circle of students, numbering hundreds. His famous student, Ibn al-Atar, reported that a great number attended his classes, and among them were well-known ulama, fuqaha, hufad, leaders, and ministers. Not only was he an expert in hadith, but he was just like other great scholars, who was also well-versed in all other aspects of scholarship. He made special contributions to fiqh, to linguistics, to the deen. His shara of Sahih Muslim is a standard reference for this unique hadith collection, while his al-minhaj is used for the study of fiqh. We know his bigger collection also, the hadith collection of Riyadh al-Salihin as well, very famous to this day. A famous historian of Dahabi said that an nawi combined the qualities of ascetic with the qualities of a hafiz of hadith and his sciences. His student Ibn al said that he was a hafiz of the hadith, being most conversant in all their categories, their soundness and defects, uncommon words, correct meanings, legal deductions and implications. Now we had an endless thirst for knowledge, and these qualities of scholarship were coupled with a life of exceptional piety, righteousness and simplicity. Imam an nawawi made full benefit of the qualities and the potential that Allah Azzawajal endowed him with, and he earned the highest degree of honor. He lived, unfortunately, a very short life, yet, subhanAllah, during this short period, he wrote a large number of books on different subjects. And each work has been recognized as a valuable treasure by this ummah. Imam Nawawi earned kabul from the ummah of the knowledge that he has brought. And this is only a unique blessing that the righteous scholars have been given for their works. There's so many scholars in this ummah, or most of the scholars of the ummah have been unfortunately forgotten, and their works lost. And this is really a great ni'mah that Allah endows on those people, those scholars, those righteous people, that have transmitted knowledge which we still study and learn and use to this day. And this is the Sadaqa Jariya for them until even long after their passing. So let us also strive to gain this knowledge to get the best and the blessing of what the Prophet has transmitted to us. Imam Nawawi, during the last part of his life, devoted himself to putting all his knowledge in books. And this is really a very intelligent, writing numerous collections of books. And by this, he benefited the Ummah greatly. And this is how his knowledge has been transmitted to us and keeps on being transmitted. The likes of Imam Nawawi and those who followed in similar path. Okay. After 20 years, Imam Nawawi returned to his home in Nawa and soon after his arrival, he fell ill and died on the 24th of Rajab, 676 after Hijri, at the age of 44, Rahimullah. It was, he was only 44 years old, and yet so many numerous works, so much that he has done in that short period of time, and may Allah reward him and also allow us to follow in his footsteps. Ameen. As we're going into this Arba'un, or Arba'in, the 40. We've already briefly just recited the first hadith. But Imam Nawi actually wrote a muqaddimah which is very important. And I think it's very important that we go through this muqaddimah. Unfortunately, many times even in the, the transliteration of the 40 hadith, uh, this is not mentioned, this introduction. So let us go through because there's many nice lessons for us, inshallah in his muqaddim or introduction. Praise is to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the only provider and sustainer of the heavens and the earth, the mastermind of all the creatures, the senders of the messengers to all the adolescents in order to guide them. And offer elucidation of the canons of their religion with clear-cut evidence and explicit preemptory proofs. Praise unto him for all his grace and I ask him, for more of his bounty and generosity, and I bear witness that there is no God with no partner.
the only one God, the supreme, mighty, the glorious, the forgiving. And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is his messenger, slave, beloved, and his intimate friend, the best of creatures who was honored with the glorious Qur'an, the everlasting miracle which will remain forever and for many years to come. It will continue to be an illuminating guidance for those that seek it. Our Master Muhammad وسلم, is endowed with an idiosyncrasy reflected in his concise speech and religious tolerance. May Allah's blessing be upon him and all other prophets and messengers and all of their families and the remaining of the righteous. But then it has been narrated from Ali ibn Abi Talib and Abdullah bin Mas'ud and Mu'ad bin Jabal and Abu Darda and Ibn Umar ibn Abbas and Anas bin Malik Abu Huraira and Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and many other chains of narrations with many marvelous varieties of narrations that indeed the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu says whoever safeguards or documents 40 hadith for my ummah on the issues of their religious matters he shall be resurrected the day of judgment in the congregation of scholars and knowledgeable in another narration Allah shall resurrect him as a jurist faqih and knowledgeable in the narration of Abi Darda I shall be his intercessor and a witness on the Day of Judgment. Further, in the narration of Ibn Mas'ud, he would be told that enter any of the doors of paradise that you wish. In the narration of Ibn Omar, he said, uh, Ibn Omar, he shall be included among the scholars and shall be resurrected in the group of martyrs, shuhada. And nonetheless, the experts in the field of hadith agree that the hadith is weak, although it has many chains. So here the Imam starts with praising Allah, talks about the fadl of uh, Rasul and also the greatness of the Quran, which is the greatest miracle of the Prophet among other many important points. And then he goes into this hadith on the 40 hadith. Whoever safeguards or documents 40 hadith for my ummah on the issues of their religious matters, he shall be resurrected on the day of judgment as a scholar. Imam Nawi is busy putting together the proofs for this hadith and the why is he putting together all these different narrations together. At the end he says, it has been agreed that this hadith is da'if. And here this is one important note to talk about weak hadith. He wants to strengthen this hadith which is weak and elevate its, its status. Okay. So it can be applied and indeed he is using this as a basis, as foundation for transmitting this knowledge. 40 hadith. And from this we should also realize that using a weak hadith is not a simple matter. We should be very careful in application using weak hadith. We have to rely on the ulama to judge exactly which hadith, weak hadith can be used. Some scholars are able to elevate the weak into authentic based on their knowledge and gathering other chains as well. So it's very important that uh, we be extremely careful with weak hadith. And here Imam Nawi is also elucidating and uh, shedding more light and giving bolster to this weak hadith so that we can obtain some benefit. Then he mentions, the scholars have compiled countless works and treaties on the subject of 40 hadith. Hence, the first person I knew that authored the book on this was Abdullah bin Mubarak, a famous hadith scholar. Then Muhammad ibn Aslam at tusi Then Hassan bin Sufyan al Nasai, and again another famous scholar of who has his own book on Nasai of Hadith and Abu Bakr al-Jurri and Abu Bakr ibn Ibrahim al-Asfahani and Dar al-Qutni al-Hakim Abu Naim Abu Abdul Rahman al-Sulami and Abu Sa'id al-Malini and Abu Uthman al-Sabuni and Abdullah bin Muhammad al-Ansari and Abu Bakr al-Bayhaqi and many others among the predecessors and successors so this is basically on the path of those who have also compiled treaties on 40 hadith. So this is not the first person to do that. Imam Nawi is following in these great muhadditin's footsteps regarding this and then also bolstering his knee and purpose for doing this and laying this out for us. Indeed, Allah the Almighty has made it possible for me to compile 40 hadith by imitating the footsteps of the sagacious, versatile, and eminent experts of hadith in Islam. Verily, scholars have agreed that it is permissible to use the weak hadith on motivational actions or virtues. 
In spite of this, this is not my reliance on this hadith by the saying of the Prophet ﷺ in the authentic narration, which goes thus, for the present who witnesses his speech should convey to the absentee. So here, apart from this weak hadith, there's other authentic reasons for Imam Nawawi to transmit these greater hadith. Okay, so this is not just based on a weak tradition, no, there's other proofs for transmitting hadith to others. And this is something also that we inshallah should have the intention to do as well. For ourselves, after we practice it, put these and transmit these to our families. In fact, what I recommend is the uh, commentary, for example, read it with your family. It's great for everyone. And also the Prophet saw some saying that may Allah bless a person that listens to my word and imbibes it and conveys it exactly the way he heard it. Then there are many scholars who compiled compiled 40 hadith on the fundamentals of Islam. Some of them in the branches, some in jihad, some in ascetism, some in arts and literature, and some in speeches. All these are good purposes and may Allah Almighty reward good intention. I see a new collection of 40 hadith. Imam an nawi continues, I see a new collection of 40 hadith as the most important of all of these. These are 40 hadith containing all these aspects. In each hadith, from them, Imam al nawawi continues, I see a new collection of 40 hadith as the most important of all these. These are 40 hadith containing all these aspects. In each hadith, from them is a great base of religious rules or tenets. Scholars have described regarding each hadith that Islam revolves around them, or they are considered as half of Islam, or a third of it, or the like. Then I will ensure these 40 hadith as being authentic. Most are from the authentic books of Al-Bukhari and Muslim, and I shall mention them with omission of the chains of narrations in order to make its memorization easy and encompass overall benefit by Allah's grace. Then I follow it with a chapter of precision and inherent wordings. It is important for everyone hoping for reward in the hereafter to know all these ahadith for all inclusive importance. And it, the collection, contains the warning on all acts of worship so that it's apparent to those who ponder over it. And unto Allah the Almighty I rely, and to Him I direct my mandate and my request, and all glory and blessing belong to Him alone. With Him, success is ascertained and protection is guaranteed. An Nawawi. So this is the grand introduction of Imam An Nawawi to his 40 collection of hadith regarding the most important ahadith which uh, make up the foundation of Islamic principles. So as we go into the introduction, we're also now going to the history of the Arba'un. Now, what's the difference between Arba'un versus Arba'in? Well, that's a grammatical issue. Arba'un is typically the subject, and it is in the grammar state of marfu or raf, versus Arba'in, which is either nasab or jar, as the object. So often it's interchangeable. Both are the same. However, Arba'un, if you're talking about this collection from the aspect of a subject, you would refer to it as Arba'un. You know, it's like, for example, Banu Israel versus Bani Israel. Banu is if you're referring to the children of Israel as the subject, versus Bani is object. So, same thing, but the grammatical significance is different. So why is it called Arba'un? When there's 42 hadith, well this relates to an aspect of Arabic culture of nomenclature regarding approximation of numbers, particularly with respect to uh, compiling a poem or a work. For example, you have thousand line poetry or thousand few lines or thousand and five or thousand and ten. If you compile a poem, then you would call it Alfiya or the thousand liner. So similarly, if you have 50 hadith, you would say Al-Khamsun. Or if you have 55, you can also say Al-Khamsun or 54. The thing is that there's approximation. So even though there's 42 hadith, you don't say Itna wa Arba'un. You say Arba'un, khalas, that's it. And this basically is understood to be a collection of approximately 40 hadith. And this is where you get this approximation on the name of Arba'un. But Arba'un, it wasn't just Imam Nawi's credit, he actually extracted or took 26 hadith of another famous hadith scholar by the name of Ibn Salah. And he, Ibn Salah, wrote the famous Al-Muqaddimah. This was a great book 
on, and it's still unprecedented, a, a book on Mustalah Hadith, the sciences of Hadith. And Ibn Salah took 26 very important Hadith which had excellent and central principles of Islam. He passed before he could you know, um, add more to his collection, but this is basically where Imam Nawi came and took these 26 Hadith, and to them he added 16 additional Hadith, and this basically became the Arba'un of Imam an nawawi rahimullah. But was it Imam Nawi who made his collection famous? No, it was actually a scholar after him named Imam Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali. And Ibn Rajab took the work of Imam Nawi and added now eight more hadith to make it khamsun. His work on the explanation of the Arba'in and also the additional eight hadith is called Jami al al-Hikam. And this is actually the classical reference for interpretation and explanation of the Arba'un. You have a more contemporary one, which is the most thorough in the English language, the Sharh by Sheikh Jamal al-Din al-Zarabozo, exceptionally comprehensive commentary. It's perhaps better for the imam or scholar, but uh, if you want to go more deeper into the Arba'un or Arba'in, I would refer you to these two resources, the Jami al al-Hikam, which is basically in Arabic. I don't believe there's an English translation. And also work by Sheikh Zorobozo. So with this, we, we have concluded the introduction to the 40 Hadith of Imam al nawawi Jazakallah khairan for attendance. And we hope to see you in the next session. Next session, we'll go into actually the commentary of the great and grand Hadith of intention. And hope to see you next time. Subhanak Allahumma wa hamdik wa nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta wa nasakfiqatubu ilayka assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.